First off, we think about neural input. This is important to our external intercostal muscles, internal intercostal muscles from the intercostal nerves, as well as the diaphragm from the phrenic nerve. So neural input via motor neurons is sort of the first trigger um, in terms of ventilation. Then we have these muscles contracting. So these muscles are gonna contract. We talked about how the orientation of the fibers means that they'll pull the thoracic cavity, the ribs, um, the, uh, the sternum, the costal cartilage. It will pull those structures in different directions. So external pulls them up and out, internal pulls them down and in. But specifically here, we're looking about, we think about inspiration. So the diaphragm, which flattens down, and the external intercostals, which increases the shape of the cavity. So those things happen. Then the chest wall expands. So that's the first um, sort of factor, the change in the shape of the cavity, which pulls on the pleura, right? The parietal pleura, which is attached to the thoracic wall, also attached to the visceral pleura, which is attached to the lungs. Again, which is why a pneumothorax is so dangerous. It interrupts the connection between those three structures. Changing the shape of the thoracic cavity should also result in changing uh, or pulling the visceral pleura, which pulls the lungs open, which drops that alveolar pressure, which allows for the suction or inspiration. So pulling on the pleura, which includes the intrapleural fluid, is sort of the next step. This is gonna cause a drop in intrapulmonary pressure, all right? Which increases our transpulmonary pressure, our distending pressure, which pulls on the visceral pleura, okay? So now we can increase volume. So this spot here, this part of the flow chart, is the um, application of Boyle's Law. Drop in or increase in uh, pressure, sorry, sorry, increase in volume in the thoracic cavity, drops the pressure in thoracic cavity, which then increases airflow. So air comes into the alveolus, right? There's a drop in alveolar pressure. And then now we have an increase in airflow that's moving inward, okay? Because of that difference. Atmospheric pressure is higher, alveolar pressure is lower. Now we have a gradient. Now we have inspiratory flow. And then we can think about the negative feedback loop here. If intraalveolar pressure increases, um, that's going to be a negative feedback loop onto that same value, right? As that number increases, it's going to change our gradient, essentially. And then now we're going to have a stop, right? Now we're going to have um, an end to that cycle, that cyclical process. So we're not just going to bring air in, you know, with no end, right? We're going to have air flow inward until this becomes a negative feedback loop. The alveolar pressure now drops, and then we move the cycle in the opposite direction. So here's what that looks like. Here is the alveolus, the pleural cavity. So intrapleural pressure here, intraalveolar pressure here, atmospheric pressure here. Across these two locations, right, these two values creates our gradient, atmospheric pressure minus alveolar pressure. And then across these two structures creates our distending pressure, our transpulmonary pressure, which is alveolar pressure minus intrapleural pressure. So all of these factors are needed. Both of these gradients are needed. This has to be negative four millimeters of mercury. And then this has to be a gradient in favor of airflow depending on the cycle, either internally or externally. Um, and then here again is how inspiration changes these values. So our um, first curve here bring our intraalveolar pressure. This drops with inspiration because of an increase in the volume of the thoracic cavity, again, Boyle's law. That results in a drop in intrapleural pressure, right? Which means that transpulmonary pressure is going to increase. And then in terms of the volume here, so this is how the thoracic cavity is changing. The cavity gets larger because of those muscles, so the volume increases. So this happens first, volume increases first, then the pressure drops, 
and then the intracoronary pressure is going to follow as well. And then during expiration, we see the opposite. There's a rise in intraabdominal pressure because of a drop in the uh, the volume because of a contraction uh, or of those muscles. Well, relaxation for the diaphragm, which causes a uh, um, contraction of the cavity. The cavity gets smaller as the diaphragm relaxes. That results in a rise in intraalveolar pressure. Again, Boyle's law, these are inversely related. And then that results in a rise in intraflow pressure. All right. Okay. Um, lastly, we want to think about the mechanics of breathing here. So expiration, we describe this as being a passive process under normal circumstances. If you're just sitting at rest, quietly breathing, your inspiratory muscles are enough to keep that process going. And then when they are relaxing, the lungs can simply recoil as the, the thoracic cavity goes back to its original position. So this becomes a passive process normally. However, during exertion, during um, exercise, during respiratory distress, now we're going to engage expiratory muscles like the abdominal muscles, the rectus abdominis, the abdominal oblique muscles, and their contractions create a, a greater and faster drop in the volume. They kind of squash the thoracic cavity more forcefully, which really helps to force air out as opposed to the passive recoil, which is what happens under normal, you know, resting, passive breathing. Okay. So during active expiration, now we engage some of our expiratory muscles.